Walk into any grocery store in America today and you will find an entire aisle dedicated to the ultimate convenience condiment, bottled salad dressing. It's been mostly dominated by a few leading brands for decades, including Wishbone. You know Wishbone salad dressing. It was the one that put Italian salad dressing on the table in homes across the country with its distinctive wishbone-shaped bottle. Wishbone Italian, for people who really like salads. Technically, Wishbone is not the first Italian salad dressing. Ken's Steakhouse in Massachusetts has that distinction. But Wishbone does claim to have been the number one Italian salad dressing for over 50 years. And that empire that Wishbone created started in 1945 with a single restaurant in Kansas City. From KCUR Studios in Kansas City and the Missouri Humanities Council, this is Hungry for Mo, a podcast about the stories behind the iconic foods that shape our region. I'm Jenny Vergara. And I'm Natasha Bailey. On today's episode, the never-before-heard story of Philip Salome's Wishbone Restaurant, how it created a salad dressing empire, and how his family is now trying to reclaim their legacy. All right, Natasha, we're here to talk about Wishbone Restaurant. Okay. Do you know anything about it? Nothing. May I show you one of my historic postcards that I brought specifically to show you? Very bed and breakfast vibes. So describe what you're seeing. I see a little, um, like, brick fence lining um, a lot of grassy area. There's a sign that says the Wishbone Fried Chicken Dinners, delicious prime rib. looks like a brick, a red brick building with red and white awnings. Kind of like a house. It looks like a house. It's very inviting. Okay, now flip it over and tell me what you see there on the back at the top. (laughs) The Wishbone. Wishbone salad dressing. Now that I know. Okay, so it even has the iconic Wishbone salad dressing bottle. Yes. So did you know that Wishbone salad dressing originated from the Wishbone restaurant that was founded here in Kansas City? I did not. Wishbone salad dressing was invented in Kansas City. Okay. So we're going to get into that. We've got the whole history to talk about. We have lots of people that we reached out to for this story. Um, One of them was local chef Jasper Mirable. I used to go to the Wishbone when I was very, very young. Who owns Jasper's Restaurant in Marco Polo, obviously, here in Kansas City. And so he remembers very clearly going to the Wishbone Restaurant with his family. You know, we knew the family very well from the Wishbone Restaurant. And I think, you know, at a very young age, I realized that this is family dining. You know, you sit at the table and it's Sunday dinner. It's fried chicken. I mean, I think that's where I fell in love with fried chicken. He remembers his dad getting up from the table and, like, making the rounds and, like, shaking hands. And a lot of the restaurateurs, particularly Italian restaurateurs, seem to kind of focus and and find their their home here. You know, we didn't always eat spaghetti and meatballs. Come on. Italians in Kansas City ate a lot of fried chicken. So, you know, Jasper has these memories of this place. It was a three-story red house. And he goes, it's like a southern mansion. And he said inside there was, like, tablecloths. It was family style, but it was upscale. I mean, there was nice curtains on the wall, beautiful carpet on the floor, you know, kind of glass cut crystal, you know, glasses they were drinking out of. It was a nicer place to go, but it was still considered a family place. One of the things that they served was salad at Wishbone that you would get with your fried chicken dinner. And it came with Italian dressing. And people went wild for this dressing. Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced this um, where you go somewhere and like, they're just known for this thing. Yes. Wishbone Restaurant became known for their Wishbone salad dressing. So I think it all really started making it in five gallon containers and somebody tastes that dressing and says, wow, you need to put this in a bottle. They were asking if they could buy it. Like they would taste it in the restaurant. They were like, We love this dressing. You know, is there a way we can get a jar to go home? Can we purchase some of this to go? So what happens, the next step, they start bottling it at the restaurant. And the story after that is that wishbone salad dressing becomes big, like really big. And the restaurant kind of goes away. But before I get into that, I really wanted to understand more about the Salome family who created this dressing. 
it was really important to me to try to have some family in here, which was tricky because they have never done media interviews and no one really knows much about them. They moved away to Arizona, I think many, many decades ago. But I enlisted Jasper's help to try to find Phil, the son of the original Wishbone creator. And one day Jasper texted me and was like, I got him. We found him, this is him, this is the man himself. So please allow me to introduce you to Phil Salome. So it was Solomy in okay. Sicily, and it's S-O-L-L-A-M-I. Phil, by the way, did not originally want to come in and do this interview because he just didn't have a lot of wishbone history. He was only a kid at the time. But Chef Jasper and his son convinced him. The only reason I'm here today is because of my son and Jasper. That's it. So I just acquiesced here just like two days ago. I just folded like a tent. <laughs> Welcome, Phil. Right? Glad okay. to have you. And his son joined us for the interview, too, which turned out to be absolutely incredible. It's a great opportunity just to just to put his name back out there and just get to speak about him. They ended up actually coming in here in person because Phil happened to be in town when we reached out, even though he lives in Arizona. But before we go any further, there's something you really need to know about the men in this family. They are all named Phil. Like the original guy who opened Wishbone Restaurant was Philip Salome I, a.k.a. Grandpa. Then he had a son named Philip, Salome. <laughs> then he, in turn, had a son named Philip Salome. So I'm Philip Anthony Salome Jr. We didn't want a third in the family necessarily, okay. so we changed his middle name to Joseph. So he's Philip Joseph. So for the purposes of this conversation, we'll think of Phil Salome as the first, a.k.a. the grandfather, Phil as the second, which is the father, and Philip the third as the son. And using Phil, I was able to piece together a story of Phil Salome the first, Grandpa Phil. So how we end up with the Wishbone Restaurant and the Wishbone Salad Dressing Empire is that he was actually born in Cleveland, Ohio. And his dad passed away very young, but he was living with his mom, Lena, and they had a cafe at the time. So there was restaurant blood kind of already in the mix. And my dad went to Ohio State. He was a veterinarian, believe it or not. And then the war came. And he got drafted in the war as a veterinarian to take care of the animals oh. in Leavenworth, Kansas. So that's how he migrated out here. And uh, during the war, somehow, he also opened a little restaurant with my grandmother, his mom, called Brooklyn Spaghetti House. Basically, they knew that there was a lot of soldiers that were in the military that were stationed at Leavenworth that knew the name Brooklyn, that were from the East Coast and missing that food. And it served exactly what the name says. It was pretty much, you know, pasta all day long. So eventually the war's over and Philip moves to Kansas City, Missouri with his mother, Lena. They decided at that point to open the Wishbone restaurant together here in Kansas City. And they named it Wishbone because fried chicken was their thing. Everybody knows about, you know, making a wish, breaking the wishbone. Do you do you do that at your house? Yes. Right? It's kind of a big fight. I remember fighting as a kid. Like, I had two brothers, so I had to really throw down if I wanted to try to win that one. That's so cute. I'm the oldest, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there you go. So it was the mid-1940s when they moved to Kansas City and opened up the wishbone restaurant. And Phil, the father, does not remember the wishbone restaurant restaurant at all. I was born in 53, so I think I came after. It was my dad and my mom and all his relatives and my sister Linda and my parents lived on the third floor of the restaurant. It was this southern mansion that was at 45th and Main, and they lived on the third floor and then basically ran the restaurant that was underneath them as a family. And takes off immediately. I mean, it's popular. People are coming to have the fried chicken. And he realizes that he wants his mother's salad dressing recipe to serve on the salad at the restaurant. His mother's from Sicily, and she just had a very simple kind of vinaigrette salad dressing that she used to make at home. And he said, Mom, can you scale that up? Like, that's something I want to put on the salad at the restaurant. So she totally kind of put the recipe together for him and gave it to him. And he started mixing it up and putting it on the salads. And the second that he started putting it on salads was the second that the legacy was like born. People loved this salad dressing. They loved the flavor of it. It was bright. It was kind of 
you know, zesty and spicy. It was full of kind of herbs. I mean, it was one of those things where it was a simple vinaigrette of olive oil and vinegar, but then it had all these other kind of things in it that really made it craveable. I mean, people were obsessed with the salad dressing. And basically, the family was, was making it in 50-gallon buckets out back, you know, down in the basement of the house, you know, putting the salad dressing together because it was just, it took off. People were wanting to buy jars of it. People were wanting to take it home. And they were realizing that they had a hit on their hands. I need to find that picture of Papa in the suit next to the um, the big, uh, what do you, what'd you bat? Be? Yeah, the big vat. He's kind of got his arm he up next to it. He made the dressing in a big vat. I mean, the health department would have a fit these days. You know, there's no, none of that. Standing there in like a gray silk suit, just kind of, you know, had this look on his face. So at this point, they know the salad dressing is a hit and they've got to make a decision. They, They don't feel like they can keep the restaurant and explore what they can do with the salad dressing. They feel like the salad dressing might have its own trajectory, its own business plan, if you will. So they go ahead and it's, you know, somewhere around the 1950s, they decide to sell the restaurant. Because he sold the restaurant from what he told me because the business was getting too big in the salad dressing side. So he needed to focus his attention on that. So that's how the business kind of morphed into the salad dressing business. At this point now, Grandpa, Philip Salome, he has entered the world, the cutthroat world of salad dressing sales. I mean, seriously, right? He's got to figure out now how to get his little bottled dressing into grocery stores on that shelf nationwide. It was like like almost a, an overnight success. It became very, very popular, and it started becoming almost national in scope, certainly regional. It was getting into the supermarket, which was very competitive, and he got his share in the supermarkets. But some of the big boys in the salad dressing company didn't like it, and they were out to kind of squash him. So I remember a story he was telling me, and my Uncle Bob was there, and he was with Dad in the wishbone. And they all were in a big room, and they are talking about strategy. And he was going around asking all the family and, and higher people, what do we do to, you know, thwart this? I mean, we have craft. I mean, we have all these guys that could squish us like a bug. How do we compete about, against them? And every one of them said, lower the price, lower the price, lower the price. And my dad, after hearing all this, he looks at him and goes, nope, we're going to raise the price. And they go, What? Yeah, we're going to raise the price. We're going to make our, we have a great product. We're not going to sell it for nothing. And people are going to realize it's a great product worth paying for. And that's what they did. I wonder at that time how many options each brand did have. Mm -hmm. Probably not that many back then, if you think. I mean, this is the 40s and 50s, but it was certainly the start. I would tell you the 50s was probably the start of convenience food. I like that. Yeah, I think these little dressings, some jello molds, like... (laughs) I mean, it just makes me think of of the start of the housewife, you know, like really going to the grocery store, picking out the salad dressing, getting it home on the table. Family falls in love with it. It's a staple now. We actually reached out to a food historian named Ken Albala from Stockton, California, and he kind of helped us understand, like, where salad dressing was. When Wishbone was first invented... It was sort of a signature salad dressing, and people loved to have the bottled form that was the same as they could buy in the restaurant. You know, that's that's a phenomenon that is uniquely American, that a restaurant could market a product that they have so broadly and make much more money at that than, than running a restaurant. And he basically explained that bottled salad dressing is 100% an American invention. It was all a matter of convenience, you know. I think that's the way Wishbone did very well, is they told people, you don't have to mix salad dressing because you're incompetent in the kitchen, and we'll do it for you. Just as a great diamond cutter devotes all of his care and skill to creating a perfect diamond, we devote all of ours to creating perfect salad dressings, like Wishbone Italian, a skillful... In the 70s, the value of something being handmade and care and craftsmanship it was foremost, again, partly like hippie era, <laughs> you know, macrame beading and things. And those channeled expertise and craftsmanship and ignored that it was industrially made product. So this was literally an American movement. And, you know, if you think about this, so along with convenience food, there was also this idea of like telling housewives to feed their family healthy, good, nutritious meals. 
people thought having a salad at the beginning of your meal was a good thing to promote health. And, you know, how do you make a salad more palatable? How do you make any vegetable more palatable to a child? Put a sauce on it. <laughs> you dress it. <laughs> Italian bottled salad dressing kind of falls in between, like, Chef Boyardee and SpaghettiOs. Like, it's kind of all part of this uh, Italian-American kind of flavor profile that we start to see. And this is something that Ken kind of talked about. Those are really Italian-American foods. They're, they're invented here. It was kind of part of the, you know, beginnings of us understanding Italian-American culture and cuisine and flavor profiles. And it was convenience food. I mean, you'd open up a can of Chef Boyardee and your family was fed. Toss a salad with a little bit of Italian, wishbone Italian salad dressing, and there's your vegetable. It's healthy now. But what we see is that bottled dressings really started to kind of fall out of favor, and they started to be kind of considered declassé because in about the 1980s, people started to become foodies, so to speak. The discovery of olive oil meant that people began to look down on bottled salad dressing. Olive oil marketed itself very, very well to, to elite consumers. So that's how Ken said the business of salad dressing moved forward in the later half of the 20th century. But Phil, the grandfather, was long gone from the business by then. Coming up, we're heading back to the 1950s to understand why Phil left Wishbone behind. So Phil, the grandfather, was in charge of his own salad dressing company. I mean, he was pushing hard to make this thing go. He's the driver. Right. Something else to know about the Salome family is that they're super hardworking. The Salome way, the Italian way, is you just worked. And you just put your nose down and you, you just worked. He was, what, five foot one? But I remember him being seven foot tall. The kindest man I, I can ever you know, describe him and, and my dad are the same way. But, you know, got that look in his eye, like, don't mess with him kind of deal. And Phil, the father, he had his memories are a bit fuzzy during this time. Obviously, he was still a kid growing up, but he does remember him kind of working on several different initiatives kind of all around making his salad dressing go. My dad, I think, was responsible for three or four different um, types of dressing at Wishbone. I think he did the Russian and cheese. So you can kind of see where he's going from like veterinarian <laughs> to restaurateur to now kind of corporate executive. Uh, a lot of people don't know my dad did not like to fly. He was scared to death of planes. So as a business grew, he had to travel more, especially back east. And so he would take the trains everywhere to meetings. Well, that wasn't really that productive because it would take three, four days to get places. And he hated the travel. So Phil, the grandfather, finally got to the point in about the late 1950s, after he'd been running this salad dressing company for many years, that he just couldn't do it anymore. He ended up selling the salad dressing company, Wishbone Salad Dressing, to Lipton. When they bought it, I mean, our company was a fairly sizable company. I, we have in our in our uh, living room, we have a gold bottle of uh, the Italian dressing. I think it was the 10 millionth bottle sold. So back then, wow, yeah, that was kind of a big deal. Uh, Lipton ended up building quite a big plant in Independence, and that's where they, they made the dressing there. As the requirement of the sale, Phil, the grandfather, was asked to stay on and consult and just make sure that the transition happened and to continue to consult on salad dressings for years to come. He didn't really want it, but that was a condition of the sale. So he had to go to New York all the time and sit in on these board meetings. And he wasn't into the hierarchy and the strategy and all that kind of stuff. And he'd go into these big boardrooms and the chairman of Lipton would be here and everybody wanted to be close to him and my dad could care less and, you know, he, he wasn't into all that. So he would sit at these board meetings and just go, you know, I can't do this. It's just it's not me. So after a year, he resigned and he had a five-year contract. And they said, you can't resign. He goes, I can't stand this. I, I'm not a corporate guy. Eventually, Lipton was acquired by Pinnacle Foods and then ended up being acquired again by ConAgra in 2018. Despite all of these changes, Wishbone was actually manufactured here in Kansas City in Independence, Missouri. 
until actually only recently. Did you know that Wishbone for all these years had been manufactured in Kansas City? No, I did not know that it was made here. I didn't either. It was kind of a big surprise. I want to know what happened to Phil. What did he do after Wishbone? So there was a payout. And so the idea was is that he was going to retire to Arizona, take his Wishbone salad dressing money and his family and move to Arizona, which he did. That lasted like one month. He was bored out of his brain. And he, he buys a little uh, motel in central Phoenix and converts this motel into a nice hotel and opens a restaurant right next to it. And guess what? He's serving fried chicken and Italian dressing. <laughs> I mean, it's like Wishbone Part 2. Yeah, he went back to what he knew. And he called that the Arizona Ranch House Inn. The fried chicken was rocked in his corn fritters, same corn fritters he had at the Wishbone here. They were amazing. He had a lot of the same deals. Phil, the dad, has this crazy story about how Phil, the grandfather, put a stream, built a stream into the floor of this restaurant in Arizona. I mean, it was like rainbow trout in there floating around, literally. Somebody would catch the fish for them, but then they would, you know, prepare the fish, you know, you know, for the dinner. I mean, he was just like such a visionary on some things. I just don't know how the health department let that happen. <laughs> There's so many hoops to jump through, and now you've got a stream with live fish? After that, he, he also dabbled in real estate. But then when I was at, uh, in college at Arizona State, he goes, what are you going to do when you graduate? I go, I don't know, go work for somebody. And he goes, well, you know, you got to watch that corporate life again. If they don't like the way you part your hair, they're going to kick you out of there. And he goes, let's do something together. And I go, well, like what? He goes, let's open an Italian deli. I go, okay. So that's what we did. So grandfather and father now have gone into the deli business together. I mean... He said he was going to retire. He hasn't retired at all. He doesn't want to sit down. This is a family that loves food. Clearly. Yes. It was the biggest at the time with a bakery and produce and groceries and deli stuff. And we did that together for five years and then long hours. And he was really doing it for me to kind of get me started. And that's actually where Phil the father meets his wife while he's working there. Philip's mom. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> And she's like a little Italian angel. And they get married, and they have Philip the son. So now we have all three Philips in, in the world, in the mix, <laughs> in the mix at this point. So we sold that business in five years, and then he officially retired. So they all got out of the restaurant business at that point, and there's no more restaurants in the three Phil's legacy and the memory starts to fade. Right. And so this becomes kind of just part of their history, right? Back in the back in the day, kind of something that they've they did and then they've moved away from. I do want to know how they continued on because Philip the son mm -hmm. has had to have seen Wishbone on shelves. And to think that this is your grandmother Lena's recipe. And you didn't even realize. Dad was, you know, really a, a modest guy. I don't remember him, like, being with him when I was growing up, him talking to people about it. But we certainly knew mm -hmm. about the Wishbone story and proud of it. I mean, just kind of amazed by it, really. Wishbone was always the constant in our family. But Papa sold it, you know, years before we were born. and So it was just part of our legacy. After Phil, the grandfather, sold the Wishbone restaurant, it was taken over by Joe and Dora Edelman. And under their loving care, the wishbone lived on for another two decades in Kansas City. But then the business changed hands again, and the iconic mansion was eventually raised. Today, all that's really left of wishbone is the salad dressing. So do you still associate the wishbone salad dressing brand with Italian dressing, though? I definitely do. Mm -hmm. well, and the bottle. Yes. So what's distinctive about the bottle to you? The little crystal-y look that it has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that kind of set them apart was the fact that they did have the particles that were in there that was like little bits of onion and spices and different things. I mean, when you shook it up, it wasn't just like a clear dressing. Yeah. It had little, you know, f let's call them flavor molecules, yes. right? So the spices and herbs and things that made it special, you could actually see in the bottle. Because I totally thought that was garlic, you know? I'm like, ooh. And at this point... Italian salad dressing is used for a lot of different things. A lot. I mean, if I think about how I use it, I'm not pouring it over a salad these days. 
I am making Italian breadsticks with them. I'm marinating chicken with them. Yeah. I'm putting it in potato salad or pasta salad. Pasta salad, yes. And in looking at the Wishbone Salad Dressing Company and how they managed to evolve, I mean, they've changed too. They've claimed since the 1970s to be America's favorite Italian salad dressing. But they've majorly expanded in other ways as well. But as you can expect, taste buds have changed over the years. The way people eat and how they eat has changed. And they currently have seven flavors of Italian dressing, which may seem like a lot until I tell you that they have nine flavors of ranch dressing. I'm going to say ranch is the new day. (laughs) It's the new Italian for wishbone. Mm -hmm. So this was another opportunity for us to dial back in with our food historian, Ken, who was basically explaining to us that, you know, creamy dressings um, have kind of taken over at this point because they are more complicated to recreate. There's buttermilk in there and there's some herbs and things. And it's definitely not something you can make at home or not easily. And it is something that kind of sits squarely in the Midwest. I think the Midwest is literally leading the charge of this ranch dressing explosion. You know, someone once quipped that uh, in the Midwest, ranch dressing in the Midwest is a beverage. <laughs> that they just consume it. For Phil and Philip, though, I mean, obviously, Italian dressing will always be number one because it's like their family origin story. I do know we have the original recipe. We're proud of that. And you should have seen their faces when our producer, Mackenzie, asked them to share that recipe. What comes to mind from that recipe? Like, what herbs? Do you know know the herbs? Mackenzie, you're crossing the line here. (laughs) It was like trademark (laughs) infringement. Yes. Um, There's a little bit of this. uh, I think a A pinch of that. that, pinch of that. Like, we will not, we will have to kill you before we share. What a good businessman Father Phil is. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, Wishbone and the family's time in Kansas City has been on both of their minds. A lot lately, actually. Not just because of this interview, but because Philip, the son, recently moved here. I'm living, like, down the road from where he started this whole journey. Philip, the son, is here. Yes, correct. So even though... Philip, the son, grew up in Arizona with his dad. Uh, He happened to meet someone in Phoenix, Arizona, a woman, falls in love with her. Turns out she's from Kansas City. We were going back and forth at that time. So I think we did that for about nine months. And then I realized I'm going to move here. Back to where it all started. Back to where it all started. Oh, I like it. Right? And they're engaged right now to be married. In fact, when they were in studio, she was wedding dress shopping as he was sitting here with his father doing this interview. It was meant to be. It does feel oddly like it's meant to be, right? It's definitely meant to be. And I think just in talking to Phil the father, he really didn't realize how much he missed Kansas City or how much he remembered. It's funny, we drove up to our house where I was you know, raised, and uh, I was just out walking in front of it mm-hmm. and not wanting to bother the people inside. And this lady comes out, and she goes, can I help you? And we said, well, you know, I was born in this house. And, you know, she goes, are you the salad dressing people? <laughs> and I said, yes. It's really cool to be back. So um, if he had to move somewhere, we're glad it's here. It seems like we just have dad's spirit in this town when we when we were driving around. Phil the father is... He's bringing the tears. It's a big Italian family, so I'm sure there was 50 opinions uh, about what he should do, and ultimately probably it was his decision, right? Yeah. But we always talk about it. If he wouldn't have sold it, you might not be around, I might not be around, because the journey would have shifted and changed if he would have kept on. So, Because he wouldn't have had the deli in Arizona. He wouldn't have met my mom. and you know, So we like to look at it both ways. I think that this has been a real homecoming moment for this family, and I think this story is ready to be told. And I think that once they walked out of our studio, they realized that this was something that we all needed to hear. This is part of, this is something to be shared with the city of Kansas City for sure, but the state of Missouri even more so. Yes. Because this was something that came from the people who live here. I mean, this was something that we can hang, again, another product that we have created here that we can hang our hat on. Ingenuity by definition. I keep thinking too of the Sunday, the Sunday dinners and how just how 
The more I learn about communities here in Missouri, community is the word that keeps rolling through. We have so many communities here that just support each other. I mean, that's a mark that we should not only take pride in, but remember that, you know, that was something that came from here. These were people who came to Kansas City and created this incredible, you know, restaurant and salad dressing legacy. Hungry for Mo is a production of KCUR Studios with support from the Missouri Humanities Council. It's hosted by me, Jenny Vergara. And me, Natasha Bailey. This episode was written and produced by Mackenzie Martin with editing from Gabe Rosenberg and Suzanne Hogan. Sound design and mix by Mackenzie Martin and our intern, Zachary Rogers. Jean-Viev Demarteau is the head of KCUR Studios. Music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions. If you head to kcur.org slash hungry, you can see photos of Phil and Philip Salome with the iconic Wishbone Italian salad dressing. I'm Jenny Vergara. And I'm Natasha Bailey. Make sure you're subscribed to Hungry for Mo in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also shoot us an email at hungry at kcur.org. Or find us on Twitter. KCUR is at KCUR. And you can find me on Instagram at EatableKC, where you can see pictures of my lovely family and all the cheese I love to eat. And I'm at Instagram at JJ Vergara, where I post all things food and drink and information about the Test Kitchen, an underground supper club I run in Kansas City. We've got one episode left for you this season where we'll be asking the question, just what exactly is Ozark cuisine? See you then. It's my age, Mackenzie. I'm just forgetting. (laughs) Very convenient, Phil. Now suddenly you don't remember this (laughs) detail. You should hear my mother try and teach other people outside the family the meatball recipe. (laughs) And she, she, like, my aunts, his sisters have been dying to know her meatball recipe. And she'll show them, but then certain times she'll, like, kind of turn her back and toss a little couple things in here. Or leave out this and then go, geez, we tried to make it at home. It's not quite the same. My Aunt Michelle's looking over her shoulders like, what did you just put in there? Oh, I don't even know. I can't remember. So this is not uh, unusual.